Now back to evolution, the framework one version of this, there's an order of play. And this is very interesting. And Teilhard de Chardin, a paleontologist, a geologist, and a Catholic priest, uh, did science and was relegated to Siberia where he did brilliant work. And it was unpublished until after his death. And it's had a large effect in postmodern thinking. And in fact, he called it a geosphere. I've put this in here to represent the physical elements. He was a geologist, so, you know, and this comes from a traditional, even pre-modern, you know, we have the mineral world, we have the vegetable world, we have the animal world, and then we have the human world as an order of play in evolutionary terms. And so this kind of fits to that. The physiosphere is just all uh, quantum fields, all molecules, all chemicals with no reproductive life. As soon as reproductive life happens, as soon as cellular life that can reproduce happens, we now have a biosphere that's emerging in framework one terms only. Framework two, when you talk to these dead guys, as we call them, it's, it's very zen, and they're coming from a simultaneous perspective, and they are frustrated by our linear thinking, and they're always trying to get us into a nonlinear frame of mind, and yet both are appropriate here in the proper context. So this is standard linear, even modern thinking. But I believe it's accurate in framework one terms. So cellular life, basic life forms, plant, and then animal. And you get up to sophisticated limbic systems, nervous systems, before the focus personality can manifest in framework one constructions. Then we have a new sphere. This is now a new quality, a new emergent quality. So this is an interesting order of play that current modern and postmodern evolutionary theory is more or less consonant with. So that's an interesting thing we're going to come back to. Now Seth's creation of, and reading the Seth material and trying to plug it into standard linear thinking, of course, doesn't work. And you'll, you'll come into all sorts of problems. However, I tried. <laughs> and, and, and it's worth the exercise of doing that and, and finding where you fail with that. But there is a similar order that you can tease out of it, but it's very thin, you know, that he does say there is an order, but he's also talking about the dream walkers. He's talking about all of this existing elsewhere before the beginning and that early man in dream bodies he calls sleepwalkers. And in Elias's continuation or expansion, he calls them dream walkers. Chris calls them dream ancestors. The Aborigines, I believe, call them dream ancestors also. Uh, the Aboriginal creation myth, by the way, is startlingly similar to the Sethian and Elysian and Christian creation myth. So, so there's an order of play in framework one, but we're in this simultaneous kind of wrestling with non-physical, involutionary, metaphysical concepts. And we're trying with this integral map to situate all of them, give them their play. They are contradictory on different levels. But part of this integral theory allows us to situate contradictory elements and not say, well, this contradicts, so we have to get rid of it. We, we keep it up here, and we, we keep it up there as long as we can. Thus, conscious creation more accurately applies to any, in my opinion, modern or postmodern body of work that explores simultaneous action of involution, evolution, and physical, subtle, and causal fields. However, we can define that, in, and this is general enough you know, that we can distort the hell out of it and, and kill it. So a lot of stuff can get plugged in at this point. Now, this chart is interesting because it, it's worth a thousand words. <laughs> I'll take three minutes and try and summarize. This, this I got from, uh, I need my pointer. It's uh, in that front cover by the red folder somewhere laying horizontal. This, this kind of includes the states. If we think back to that scale, that aqua, those five parts of consciousness, this includes the, the states. And it, and it proposes that these are different fields. I'm using a field analogy, and someone will criticize me for that because it's too materialistic speaking. But I, I like this symmetry here of causal, subtle, physical. And notice the arrows go both ways. So it's blinking in, blinking out, white hole, black hole. And the same thing with, with the states. You know, We don't just go to waking, sleeping. There's in between hypnagogic states. We may wake up. We pulse up and down, and there's maps of doing that, which is interesting in dream research that uh, in the 1950s, when they were finally able to map the, the dreaming state and, and empirically, materialistically map it, suddenly dreams were real. Up until then, they were not real. And what did Frank say last night? Uh, 
he, he cited something early in his talk about a medical body and something was not considered real. It was con oh, thoughts of good health were considered pathological. An expectation of good health was, was mental illness, which just shows how the, these memes and belief systems develop in their own ways too. So I put involution up here as sort of, this is what's happening in this causal field. It's emanating, it's creating, because it's creating this too. All of this, you know, is also this simultaneous frothy mixture of things. Down here then is our linear little storyline in our framework one terms. And the order of play in the beginning, there's a physiosphere. Our current creation myth is a big bang. It's okay. There may not be a Big Bang. It could have always just been. With cycling through, the, the Hindus have a concept of yuga, and these are billion year cycles. And is there a Big Bang every 600 billion years? Or is there just a, you know, a zap, you know, a, a light body, a flash of light? Something is cycling. When it starts, when an in the beginning happens again, there's just physical manifestation. Now this is, this is the paradox that I'm still wrestling with from these different sources. But if I, the only thought experiment I've been able to come up with is if I have a video camera there, what am I measuring? And it's clouds of gas. And billions of years go by before hydrogen and oxygen even start to emerge from the birth and death of stars to then form planets and other bodies of material. So this physiosphere goes on. Actually, this line would you know, shoot out to Jupiter to show the actual linear time scale involved in just the physical matter being around. And yet simultaneously, according to our ghosts, all these things are waiting to emerge. They're, it's inherent. And this order of play then, you have to start with self-replicating life somehow. You've got to have plants before you can have animals to feed off the plants, before it will support dinosaurs of large size and human beings. At least it makes sense. And then the new sphere, focuses of essence emerge from this. So what, what's in this part, though? You know, there's, there's hominids. There are walking apes, but they, they are not focuses of essence yet. And this is something we can at least think about. When, when is that part of, you know, the animal is, is a very complex thing. It has a limbic system, emotions, proto-emotions, feeling flight or fight. And, and it's driven by instinct. And this is where Seth, talking about early man and nature, personal reality is interesting, too and how natural guilt and, and the sense of violation emerged early on. And again, then down here, this pre-modern line goes way back. It, it could go back hundreds of millions of years. It could go back billions of years. And so modern, postmodern, these are just recent little things that we can relate to that we have evidence to look at. But it's a big picture, and we don't know anything. <laughs> and we have to admit that and then come back to the next slide. So we say it's true but partial. We acknowledge that. We say that up front. We're not selling this and promoting this story as our version. Well, it is our version of it, and take it or leave it, and, and together we can see, see what differences, critiques we have, and jointly move together with that. A, a weakness of the pre-modern tradition is that they have no understanding of evolutionary theory. It's just not there in their thinking. Um, is this more complex? Is this more superior? According to this, it is. It's, there's greater complexity involved in the understanding of evolutionary processes. Is it better or worse? I don't think so. It's more complex or less complex. And, and there's a lot of interesting uh, debates and controversy in, in those areas. Uh, yeah, okay, that's just, that's documenting some of, you know, there, there's thinkers, there's scholars, there's a lot of work out there that, that sort of supports the outline of this. Postmodernism, I think by definition, is attempting to bring consciousness with a capital C, present in the pre-modern worldviews, back with that differentiation, integration, action, while acknowledging the advances and limits of modern science. When we combine an integral approach with the previous definition of, it, of conscious creation, universe is multiverse, involution, evolution, then we get integral conscious creation. That's sort of what it's starting to look at. In short, integral conscious creation applies the checks and balances of an integral approach to any conscious creation source to help mine its many gems. And then this is just some propaganda why it's really great, and I won't bore you with it. You can go to the next slide. 
And it's a little bit more, one, one thing I like too is that the intent of this is to help demystify and legitimize the channeling phenomenon, particularly which is something near and dear to all of us who are into Seth and, and other sources. And the bottom line, it doesn't reek of scientism, new age, religious woo-woo, Sethism, Eliasism, Chrisism. The ism that, that I realize it is, is integralism. There is an ism here. And we have to be aware, you can't get away from it. Uh, ideology, there's always going to be some ism. So what, I'm propo you know, what this, these proponents are saying is integralism solves more problems that these earlier systems can't. Mindscape is called dolphins really do that? Okay. Just a, a, some brief information on who they are. They are my generation uh, in their 50s. Mary lives in Brattleboro, Chris lives in Toronto. In my view, both expand the conceptual foundation laid by Seth, how by providing detailed maps and practices. This is another thing. And Chris's avatar yoga is something he just delivered this year. You know, we talk about theory, we talk about scripture, revelation, uh, whatnot, is which, which we can apply to the Seth material. It is a type of revealed knowledge. It's not done from scientific work, in inductive reasoning or deductive reasoning. But what it provides, along with that map then, <clears throat> a revealed map, says here's some practices. You want to know this, do this. You want to test the waters, then try these things. And the best example, the closest thing of a Sethian yoga are the 17 practice elements in unknown reality. And I had my first major Satori in 1979 after slogging through those two volumes for about a year. And doing the practices and reading, I was going to graduate school and doing my music stuff uh, in my official day job, I guess, at that time. But doing, doing those practices, and it was, a, it was a two and a half hour long, what we would just call a lucid dream, but it, it was a sustained, you know, it was one of those big things, which you probably all had in your own, own ways. So the fact that they provide practices to test out the water through direct first person experience is a strength here. This, this aligns it with all the transformative traditions. And there are transformative and translative flavors of spirituality and religion. And there's the Elias website, over 20,000 pages that I've edited and published there, and over 165 digests, which are hyperlinked there, the practices that Elias has offered today to test out his waters and his, his points of view are there. there. There are not as many dream, subtle, and causal realm exercises in the Elias form. They're mostly framework one dealing with conflict, shadow, personal issues, belief recognition, and so on. Go ahead. And then the Chris Chronicles, now we've been working with them. They have over 2,500 pages published. It's given away for free. That's the business model we're exploring. It helps Serge advertise his private session business and while he's not making enough money to do that full-time, as Mary is, Mary is doing this full-time, still, it's, he's, they're graciously making this freely available because this is a Dharma teaching in the Buddhist sense. And the Dharma is free. Nobody can own it. Nobody should own it. And the politics of owning the Dharma, the bloody history of the Catholic Church, enough said. Next. Ha, ah, finally. We're done, the summary. New World View has a long history, reaches back, Maud Cardwell, Stan and Linda, Michael Steffen, Mary Rowan. NewWorldView.com is the first conscious creation internet portal. It just opened, check it out. See how you can contribute and add. We're looking for moderators and new forums. We're looking for bloggers. Spread the word, spread the link. The Seth material is our foundation. It sets the bar of excellence. It is our gold standard, it remains as such. And then finally, we use an integral conscious creation approach to show how the Seth material could take its place 
in the Western world. You can do the next one. And any questions or comments on that? Ha, what a long, strange trip it's been, huh? A lot to consider. This, again, this essay, A New World Overview, is in the intro section, and it's there, freely available, so you can go check it out. And I will be also following up with this in the months and years ahead on my blog as things develop and whatever, and I post things there so you can check that. It's under the community section. And Tara. My question isn't directly related. Uh, sure. Have you heard anything from Linda Dahl? Linda is alive and well in Dana Point, California. And that's about an hour and a half south of us in Castaic. So that's in that Los Angeles corridor, or Orange County, which she always loved. I think she had a home down there years ago. She talked about living down there. And she's working for a, a business, you know, her, her mar as a marketing, her marketing background. And that's the last we've heard of her. It's been a couple of years since we've spoken with her, but she's alive. She has a small Seth group there, I believe. No. No, I've not heard any reports of her channeling Stan. Have you heard? Yeah, well, um, Can you verify that, or is this a grapevine kind of? my own personal experience. Um, I went to a New Year's Eve party. Linda was there, plus a number of other people, Mary, Rowan, and um, you know, several of those people. And uh, Linda shared with the small group that she and her daughter had contacted uh -huh. Stan. And, and at that But anyhow, she had, they, they had contacted Stan and they were starting to get information. And that, that was the last I heard of it. And I didn't know if she was doing anything with that. Or anything. That sounds totally constant with her trajectory and, and her interests. Um, but no, I can't report of anybody else. Feedback to her. Any other questions or comments? Good. <laughs> we're all tired. Oh, there is one. Robert. So earlier you were talking about the integral approach the integral approach had checks and balances what what do you mean when you say it has checks and balances that's a very good question <clears throat> I, I can't i can't give a simple answer but i'll try and see how good i do this is really this really is the first time i presented this publicly and spoken about it so it's all all good constructive feedback that i'm getting on this in those quadrants, the quadrants, there's an inside and an outside to each quadrant. So there's eight fundamental methodologies. And according to this theory, you have to include these eight perspectives to be balanced, comprehensive, and integral. It, Ken Wilber's amps go up to 11. It's one more than anybody else's. And whether it succeeds or fails, we don't know yet. As a theory, it looks promising, but how many theories, promising theories end up on the garbage heap of history? This may, I believe, some modified form, but the methodologies that come out of it provide the interiors. We want to get an interior view. We want the exteriors. We don't want a purely materialistic or an idealistic approach to these things. We want interior and exterior together, individual collective angles. Do you ever feel odd trying to view what to me seems there's a much larger psychological or spiritual universe and trying from the small framework of the physical universe to, to take that all into account. It, it seems like you, you, know, you have a, a telescope, but you're looking in the wrong end to... It's a fundamental paradox of being a focus in framework one. And those kinds of paradoxes, though, mean we're getting closer at times. But yeah, I mean, this is just a map. The map is not the territory. We leave all these maps behind as we open into the silence of what is just this, always. It's that simple, ultimately. And yet here I am in this body that has needs and urges and desires and whatnot, and I have to attend to those in relation to all of you attending to yours. So it's a magnificent little drama we've created, right? But this is, a, again, an attempt at integrating the fragmented modernity, you know, and you can even argue that, and others do, that it's going quite pathological, it's going quite into the shitter, as we might say. Um, there's just, you know, the symptoms of wars, alienation, addiction, drug abuse, fractured family structures. Those are all symptoms of pathology, according to this. 
you know, and, and it, it represses, marginalizes, demeans the human spirit, and it doesn't allow for that growth. And there was a quote uh, one, one of the presenters put up about, you know, what you intended this place to be is not what it's turned into. And that's an interesting thought coming from, you know, sort of a framework three or four perspective. It's like, well, darn, what could it have been? And probably we experience it all anyway, but that's not good enough for me here now in this probable moment. So if uh, Jane Roberts uh, came up with the physical universe as idea construction, then what would be the construction of the non-physical universe? Oh, you Zen master. <laughs> hey, I, the, the sound of one hand clapping. I can't, I can't get a rational grasp on any of that. And, and it's not rationally graspable. However, that's where we get into the transpersonal, transverbal, translogical, that the focus is capable through direct experience. And these meditative states, you know, we have them all the time. Looking outside at that beautiful snow, suddenly a moment of a unity experience happens. And, but there, you know, the CUs are innately, I, I, I want to add another law to the universe, which is forgetting. They are imbued with forgetting, chronic forgetting, and that's the involutionary arc then the evolutionary arc is the remembering. You know, physio, physios, bios, now as nous, we're more self-aware. What comes next in framework one terms? I'm excited about the future. The potentials for what's coming potentially, you know, is really profoundly amazing in terms of our cognitive abilities, spiritual remembrance, altered states that are no longer considered altered. They're normal. As Jane said, what Jane considered her whole daily routine going into you know, a Seth trance, something she could do at will. That's a sign of a mature stage of, of the phenomenon. Uh, you mentioned about what the non-physical world would be, but you read stories about sages and saints and gurus in India and Samadhi and those places that they go into, and it's very encouraging and, it, you know, to the point of non-descriptive, it's, it's beyond what they, but they talk about, you know, that blue pearl of light and different things. Mm -hmm. What about, uh, have, you know, looking at those Sure, those stories. are the states. Yeah, as, the states. As we look at the five elements in, in, uh, in the integral scale, that's, that's one of them, states. And there's state training, meditation, and I strongly recommend it. The problem we face is finding a meditation teacher without all the pre-modern baggage. I went to a Buddhist retreat. And I spent three days there, and I never went back. It, there was too much pre-modern baggage associated with it. But it was a learning experience for me. But this is part of what I think an integral approach can do. It can help bring some of these pre-modern uh, groups and organizations, if they're up to the challenge, into a post-modern framework where what we were talking about today, at least in my talk, they can understand. You know, if they have integral awareness, then the state training, it gives you direct experience that what's, when I had my Satori in 79, the, the end result of coming back into body and knowing that this is a construction and seeing my whole inner history presented symbolically in archetypal form before me, I just said, holy shit, everything Seth's talking about has some validity to it. That just cranked me up, Person, but I validated that through and that's my experience, it's not yours. We each have to learn to create these. And so meditation practice, these exercises that Seth, Elias, Chris present, Chris's avatar yoga is beautiful. And it's just coming out this year, and I think in the years ahead it's going to be codified some more, and maybe people will become adept at it, maybe they won't. There's a co constant cycle of these things being given, bubbling up, ground up, not top down. They happen, practices are given, some people take off and groups spontaneously form. As Seth said, he says there's no need to form groups because groups spontaneously form. And mimetically, worldview-wise, there's an attractor. You know, all of us here, as uh, Frank said last night, you know, all that we went through to get here, it was no simple process. And I th I've observed myself creating the day, the travel day on Wednesday. You know, am I going to make it there alive? Will something happen? Will this be the last day I live? You know, and then I say, I choose that not to be my reality today. I love these people. I love this group. I'm looking forward to this. And I put that out of my mind. And here I am. I think our time is up. So I'll thank you. And... Uh,